February 22nd, 2022, and it is 10.01 a.m., and this is a meeting of the MEG uh, Pop Tech Committee. Uh, Scott, could you do a call to order, please? Yes, I'm going to do a roll call, uh, make sure we have, we know who all is here, and uh, so everybody at home knows who's, who's here. Um, Tracy Clark or someone from ADOT? Uh, and then I looks like we have Nick Leftwich from Apache Junction in place of Bryant Powell. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Andrea Marquez uh, Buckeye. Present. Stacey Bridge Denzak, carefree. I think I heard Stacy. Yes, I'm here. Cool. Luke or anybody from Cave Creek? Uh, Sam from Chandler? The first one to join. Present. Hi, right, Sam. Uh, Madam Chair, El Mirage? Present. Thank you. Um, Victor or anyone from Florence? So then Farhad or anyone from Fountain Hills? Anyone from Gila Bend? There's Bryant. Hey guys. Hey, Bryant Powell is present for the record. Um, where were we, uh, Gila Bend? So uh, Kyle from Gilbert? Yes, I'm here. Alex from Glendale or anyone else from Glendale? Christian or anyone from Goodyear? Present. Hey, Christian. Uh, anyone from Guadalupe? Then Sonny or anyone from Litchfield Park? And we've got Rudy from Maricopa. Mm -hmm. Ray from Maricopa County. Yes, I'm here, Scott. Uh, I will have to leave at 1025, by the way, for another meeting. Just giving you a heads up on that. Thank you. Um, Kelly or anyone from Mesa? Present. Hey, Kelly. Uh, Paul from Paradise Valley? Uh, present. Hello. Then um, I think our appointed member is uh, Rob Kufus from Peoria. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Hello. Um, Hi, this is Rob. Hey, Rob. Just checking. Did we lose Chris? He was here as well, Chris Jasper. So he may have dropped off. Um, Dave Miller from Phoenix. Here. Tara Harmon or anyone from Pinal County? Sarah from Queen Creek? Oh, you were there. Okay, we lost Sarah temporarily. Um, Brian Myers or oh, hey Sarah. Brian Myers or anyone from Salt River. Then uh, Taylor Reynolds from Scottsdale. Yep, I'm here. Lloyd from Surprise. Present. Uh, Jacob Payne from Tempe. Present. Jeff from Valley Metro. Present. Uh, Davis from Wickenburg. Present. And Gregory or anyone from Youngtown. Okay, Madam Chair, we have uh, plenty for a quorum. Thank you. Next order of business is call to the audience. Um, this will be a opportunity will be provided to members of the public to address the make pop tech on items not scheduled on the agenda that fall under the jurisdiction of MAG or on items on the agenda for discussion, but not for action. Members of the public will be requested to limit their comments to three minutes. A total of 15 minutes will be provided for this agenda item, uh, unless the chair of the pop tech provides an exception to this limit. Those wishing to comment on the action agenda items will be given an opportunity at the time the item is heard. Do we have any members of the audience that wish to speak? We've not received any comments prior to the meeting, Madam Chair. Okay, 
then we'll move on to agenda item number three, approval of the meeting minutes of October 26. So we need a motion and a second. State Miller, City of Phoenix, I have motion to approve. Lloyd Abrams, City of Surprise, second. Thank you, we have a motion and a second. All those in oh, favor? We, we can't do that anymore. What? You can't do that on video. I got to do a roll call for this too. Oh, yeah. Yes, that's right. Scott, and you even wrote it on my notes. Scott, could you do a roll call vote, please? I, I'd love to. This is my favorite part of the meeting. Reading names. Um, Tracy Clark, ADOT. Brian Powell, Apache Junction. Yes. Uh, Mark Trinidad, Avondale. Yes. Andrea Marquez, Buckeye. Yes. Stacy Bridge, Denzac, Carefree. Aye. Uh, Luke Kautzman, Cave Creek. Sam Andrea Chandler. Aye. Uh, Victor Cantu, Florence. Farhad Tavasoli, Fountain Hills. Anyone from Gila Bend? Kyle Miris Gilbert? Yes. Alex Lerma or anyone from Glendale? Christian Williams Goodyear? Aye. I thought I stumped you. Uh, anyone from Guadalupe? Sonny Colbreth or anyone from Litchfield Park? Uh, Rudy Lopez, Maricopa? Aye. Ray Banker, Maricopa County? Aye. Kelly Rorex, Mesa? Aye. Paul Michaud, uh, Paradise Valley? Aye. Rob Kufus, Peoria? I have to abstain. Fair enough. David Miller, uh, Phoenix. Aye. Tara Harmon, Pira, uh, Pinal County. Sarah Clark, Queen Creek. Aye. Brian Myers or anyone from Salt River. Taylor Reynolds, Scottsdale. Yes. Lloyd Abrams, Surprise. Aye. Jacob Payne, Tempe. Abstain. Uh, Jeff Wilkerson, Valley Metro. Aye. Uh, Davis Konauer, Wickenburg. Aye. Gregory Arrington or anyone from Youngtown. And Chair Crystal Dykes, El Mirage. Aye. Thank you, the motion passes. Next on the agenda is the census count question resolution program update. Mr. Bidwell? Well, uh, thank you. Um, give me one second to get my desktop shared here. Desktop three. Sorry, I just have to change a privacy setting real quick on my machine. Um, Uh, if it doesn't work i've got your presentation i can pull that up can we do that i'm sorry yeah, yeah. i'll give me a moment don't you love technology yeah that's what i get for having a mac i guess <laughs> all right cqr yeah i need to copy it over to my computer okay take a moment
where I'm not sure if I have permission to share my screen. Oh, there it is. So I can try, I'll keep trying to do this. I got it. You got it. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, are you seeing now? Yes, I see the presentation. Okay. Does that advance? Yep, that works. Okay. Okay, good morning. I'm sorry about the uh, technical difficulties there. Um, I'm Scott Bridwell. I'm a socioeconomic analyst at MAG. And I'm here to talk to you briefly about some of the Census 2020 review programs that are on the horizon, and as well as some uh, preliminary analysis that we've done to hopefully provide some support to um, our agencies. Uh, so the first one that's already ongoing is the Census Count Question Resolution Program, also known as CQR. And what this does is it gives uh, government agencies an opportunity to basically request that the Census Bureau review errors in the housing units and also potential issues in their municipal boundaries. Uh, so this is a program that's going on now and the submittal deadline for that is up through 2023. A new program that is online uh, for this census that is going to begin in the spring and that will run through summer 2023 as well is to have uh, the census review the population counts for group quarter facilities. So things like dorms, prisons, nursing homes, that, that kind of thing. Uh, next slide, please. So within the CQR, uh, there's basically two types of cases. There are boundary cases, and this is cases where the census has the wrong legal boundaries as of January 1st, 2020. And the other type of case is a count case where there has been some a misplacement or exclusion of housing units um, as of April 1st, 2020. And so the, the government agency requesting the review must provide documentation that suggests why they believe that is an error. And so MAG's role in this, MAG is not actually gonna provide any, any, gonna submit any CQR cases, but the idea is for us to use the data sets that we have to uh, do some preliminary checks and maybe suggest areas that might be of concern to our members. Next slide, please. So in lieu of the, the boundary dispute or the boundary type of case, uh, what we've basically done is we've reconstructed uh, boundaries using, using annexation data from Maricopa County elections uh, as of January 1st, 2020, and we've compared those against the census place boundaries. Uh, and luckily, we haven't found any significant problems with those. So for the most part, we wouldn't expect there to be any sort of boundary cases submitted to the census from anybody. Uh, next slide, please. In order to address the MAG group quarters, or I'm sorry, in order to address the group quarters cases, uh, what we've basically done is compared our group quarter facilities that we collect from member agencies and from other sources, and we've compared those against the group quarters counts at the block and the block group level uh, that are provided by the census. Uh, there are some issues with uh, doing this type of analysis. Uh, for one, we're really restricting this to major facilities. So we're looking at large dorms, looking at jails, large nursing homes, um, and restricting it to those types of cases. Another issue with doing any kind of comparison here is that differential privacy methods are being applied by the census to group quarters counts. And so it can be difficult to identify whether or not the error is because of a true error or if the error is a, I guess, intentional random error that's introduced by the differential privacy. So we're really trying to look at situations in which there's a significant difference in group quarters counts and not, you know, not smaller cases. And the other issue that we're having and looking at some of these is that there's a lot of facilities, assisted living facilities in particular, where there's a mix of group quarters and house units. And so on the surface, it might look like there might be missing group quarters, there might be missing house units, but in theory, or in reality, they're just mixed and they've moved group quarters into uh, actual households and residential units. So in terms of the preliminary analysis that we've done, we've identified around six cases or so, uh, basically six blocks or block groups where the census has less group quarters population than what we're finding based on our various inventories that we have. And the biggest one that we're seeing is a shortage in the dorms at Grand Canyon University. And that's a pretty significant one with around 4,500 short in the census. Uh, so that's something we might wanna look at a little bit further. Uh, next slide, please. And the last analysis that we've been looking at is kind of the most encompassing uh, time-wise, and that's actually looking at the housing unit analysis. And for this, what we've done is we've compared census 2020 
to our housing inventory that we maintain internally. And that housing inventory is based on a, a series of data sets, including the assessor uh, parcels. Uh, we have an apartments database we have. We have some uh, mobile home park databases and all these things are kind of compiled together into our residential units inventory. And so when we're doing this, we're basically aggregating our residential units inventory by a couple of different geographies, looking at this by block, looking at it by block group, also by place, and then comparing those with the counts that are coming out of census 2020. Um, so a couple of issues that we're seeing uh, in doing this analysis, obviously the geographies of parcels don't necessarily match the geographies of blocks or block groups. So for instance, there's a lot of cases where apartments or mobile home parks are actually split by blocks or block groups. And so, uh, you know, the parcel might actually put it into maybe a neighboring um, area when actually the census has it next door. Uh, another issue we're seeing is that the timing of new construction is difficult to match exactly. So when we receive uh, residential unit completions, we tend to get them based on when the actual uh, units are complete. And there's situations in which the census is, it looks like they've counted units basically before we've actually received those, um, those completions. So those are a little bit difficult. Um, areas with group quarters, again, are a difficult kind of area to look at. And also mobile home parks tend to be a little more difficult as well, especially places with a lot of RV spaces. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the, of the, the preliminary uh, results that we have for looking at housing units, overall, we're seeing in Maricopa County, the census is higher by about 1.8%. This is about 31,000 units or so. Um, and so far, we believe a lot of this is attributed really to kind of the new construction timing issue and also group quarters. So basically, we are counting things in group quarters and the census is counting those uh, as house units. So that's something that we're looking into a little bit closer. In Pinal County, we have the opposite situ situation where the census is lower than what we're uh, tabulating by about 1.6%. And we believe that that's likely attributed to uncertainty in capturing mobile home spaces and RV spaces. So looking at this a little bit closer for areas without mobile homes, um, we've identified around 20 to 35 cases where the census has fewer units than what MAG is expecting. Um, and that amounts to a total shortage of about 3,800 units. And what we're finding is that those are pretty much areas that have apartments. And so this is analysis we're uh, continuing doing. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of next steps, we are revising our housing analysis and our housing inventory a little bit. And we expect to get that done around March, the beginning of March. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna notify member agencies who are identifying block groups where we think that there's maybe a shortage in units. And, um, and then it would be upon the member agency to then look into that further. And so we have all this data, we have it aggregated by block and block group, and we can provide that in GIS files or whatever, um, if anybody is interested in looking at it. And we're also available for one-on-one -on -one meetings. If anybody is interested in looking at this further, we can bring up the map and we can you know, zoom in and zoom out to specific areas and look at things uh, if anybody's interested in doing that. Uh, next slide, please. So I've included a slide here that has uh, links to the census webpage for these evaluation programs. There's also an email there that you can um, contact someone directly as well as a phone number. Uh, next slide, please. And these are the contacts at MAG that you can contact myself. You can talk, contact Jesse Ayers, who's a Socioeconomic Economic Modeling Program Manager, or you can contact Scott Wilkin, and we'll be happy to provide you with whatever data that you would like, uh, as well as um, set up some kind of online meeting. And that's it. That's all I have. Thank you so much for the report, Scott. Does anybody have questions or um, comments? I just wanted to mention that um, the, that URL was on the screen pretty briefly. I'll send that out to everybody, all that information um, after the meeting. Thank you, Scott. Okay, hearing um, no, no questions, um, we'll move on to uh, number five, short-term rental analysis. And uh, Jesse is going to provide us an update on that. Thanks. Okay, I think I've got my screen shared here and I'm hoping that everyone can hear me. Okay, great. Uh, so what I have for you today is uh, an analysis of the short-term rental market in Arizona and the MAG region. 
Um, recently, most recently in December of 2021, we purchased a, a couple of data sets from a firm called AirDNA. And what AirDNA does is they are a um, web scraping company effectively where they go out and read data off of Airbnb's website, VRBO's website, and other short-term rental websites and aggregate their data uh, to get a look at what, what is happening in the market. And so by when I say scraping, I really just mean reading and reading the data off the website into a database. So like I said, we purchased data from them in uh, December of 2021. We purchased two different data sets from them. One is a historical monthly file that goes back to October 2014. Um, and then uh, they're, they're, they're what they call a property file, which has more detail for the last 12 months of activity uh, in terms of uh, the different attributes that they collect off of the website. And um, there's definitely caveats with uh, these data sets. The, um, they don't provide the exact locations. So they give point level data, but it isn't, doesn't necessarily fall directly onto the housing unit in question. They scramble it. Um, they say it's within 500 meters of the true location. So we could certainly see you know, a dot appearing in the neighboring neighborhood or a, you know, across an arterial or something like that. Um, but we're, we figured that um, many of these small locational errors will wash out uh, around the boundaries. Um, another thing is the active status of, of these uh, short-term rentals. I mean, as, as you can probably imagine, any of us could go on and list our own homes on Airbnb or, or VRBO this afternoon and, and, you know, maybe for a month or, or and, never get, and never get any sort of uh, a booking on it. Um, so exactly what was active at any given time is kind of difficult to determine uh, because since they've scraped the data over time, it tends to uh, pick up any unit that was ever listed as a short-term rental unit, um, regardless of how long or if it ever had any bookings. So I've done some filtering to try to negate some of those, uh, those issues. So first up, let's look at the uh, monthly data that goes back to 2014. And we'll start with a table that has, um, and I didn't include actually the 2014. Uh, it's not, a, it wasn't a full year's worth of data. That's why that's not there. And 2021 does not include December. Um, but as you can see, the uh, average occupancy rate of, of the properties has steadily gone up over time. Um, Definitely, the average monthly revenue has nearly doubled across these, and certainly, um, given those the, the level of uh, average monthly revenue, one could see that making a significant uh, contribution to a mortgage payment for sure. Um, and then the average time that's active again, th th this has declined. I, I, this is something I really can't explain. I don't know if it represents more uh, people listing homes part time or. Uh, or, or exactly what this what what the discrepancy is here, but but they do seem to be averaging less time on the market with a higher average occupancy rate. So where do we have here in the growth? The growth uh, in Arizona and Maricopa County seems to have really exploded in 2017 um, for whatever reason in their data, um, and of course uh, had very little growth in 2020, but it's definitely coming back in 2021. And clearly, Maricopa County mirrors uh, the, the growth in Arizona as it does in, in, in many metrics. So uh, across Arizona, you can see where these are the growth is concentrated. Um, besides, down in, uh, our, in, in the valley, uh, up north in the Sedona and Flagstaff areas, have huge concentrations of uh, short-term rental units. And we'll get a little bit more detail here in our neck of the woods in Maricopa County. And you can see that uh, the concentrations are very, very strong in Scottsdale, Tempe, Paradise Valley. Um, it's, it's really quite clear. The, um, the numbers that you see on the screen here represent an estimated total number of growth in units. So for instance, that uh, South Scottsdale uh, or Central Scottsdale, one with 1,800 units, almost 1,900 units in it. That's the estimate that I came up with in the data in the, in the, that it grew by nearly 1900 units in that zip code during that five year time period. So that's what that means. And the, the gradient from South to North Tempe is pretty, pretty clear. And uh, yeah, Paradise Valley has their own, their own concentration as well. 
So we're gonna shift gears here for a couple of slides on some detail about the last 12 months of uh, short-term rental data. And this is a table that shows the top 10 cities in Maricopa County for short-term rental listings in the last 12 months. And I chose to sort, sort this table, not by the absolute number of listings, which would have put Phoenix at the top, but by the percentage of short-term rental listings as a percentage of their total of the city's total housing stock. So for instance, Cave Creek had 104 listings with you know, 2,800 units in total roughly, accounting for you know, a sizable portion of their, of their housing stock. Um, by contrast, up in Sedona, for instance, I think they have uh, one of the highest in the state, and I think nearly 24, 25% of their, of their dwelling units are listed as short-term rentals. Um, the average number of bookings for these uh, short-term rentals over the last 12 months is um, fairly low, um, sh showing, revealing that in all likelihood, a lot of these units sit empty an, an awful lot of the year, and the money and revenue that they generate are being generated during relatively small amounts of time uh, being booked. So the average annual revenue by city is kind of interesting. Um, you know, clearly Paradise Valley takes the top there at 100, somebody, you know, averaging nearly $120,000 annually. Um, that's pretty impressive. Um, the max annual revenue is a, is a little stranger to interpret. Um, what that means is that's the absolute highest number that anybody in the data set made on their short-term rental. So in Phoenix, one particular person with a property made $1.2 million on it in the last 12 months. So that's just the absolute max in the data set, and this is the average. And then here's one more map showing the absolute concentration of short-term rentals uh, in the last 12 months. Um, I put together sort of a combination heat and point map here. The points are those uh, locations that I referred to earlier that have a slight scramble on them. And the heat map just uh, shows sort of the concentration of uh, where they are more specifically. And really that's all I had to share with you today. If there are any questions, I'm more than happy to entertain them at this time or later. And uh, much like Scott mentioned in his, in the last presentation, uh, this is, you know, we'd be happy to uh, meet with you individually on, on these data um, and bring up your city in particular, look at, look at what the data reveals for your city if, if you, you're interested in that. We've done that for a couple of others already. Um, but feel free to contact us if you uh, if you'd like like to that kind of analysis. Does anyone have any questions for Jesse? Hey, Crystal, um, this is Brian. Hi, Brian. Um, yes, Crystal, I was just going to ask this uh, data. Is it uh, this is something that comes up at the the League of Cities and Towns every once in a while? I'm assuming Mag always is there to help out and support uh, questions that come from the league regarding this data. Absolutely. Yes. We've actually provided um, some stuff to the league already on this. Yes. So Thank definitely. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. No problem. You're welcome. Um, Jesse, Rudy Lopez, City of Maricopa. Hi, Rudy. Um, if I could maybe um, email you offline, to, I'm kind of curious to see what the numbers are for the City of Maricopa. I didn't see on the, I didn't clear on the map in our area. So if I, if I could maybe email you offline, that'd be great. Certainly. All right. Thank you. No problem. Okay, this item was for information and discussion only. So unless there's someone else that has a question or comments, we'll move on. Thank you, Jesse. You're welcome. Thank you here. There we go. Stop share. There we go. The next we have work from home analysis with Debbie Brown. Um, hi there. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the Pop Tech Committee. Um, Again, my name is Debbie Brown. I'm a GIS analyst here at MAG, and I'm happy to be here with you today to share some travel reduction program survey data. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen. How's that? Can you guys see my presentation? Looks good. All right. Let me go ahead and advance this slide. Okay, let's jump right into it. Uh, so each year we process the surveys from the Travel Reduction Program. Um, this is an annual commute survey at employer sites um, within Maricopa County that have 
50 or more employees. And the surveys are also taken at school sites, but today I'm only going to be talking about the actual employer site samples. Um, question number three of the survey asks how many days per week each one of these different modes of transportation are used um, for your trip to work. And based on the total number of trips per week that all respondents use for each one of these modes, we can see uh, what shared travel each mode has. Um, and after doing just that, we saw this noticeable difference when comparing these mode shares pre and post pandemic. Um, these are fiscal years. And at the beginning of the pandemic in March of 2020, this program was uh, put on pause. So no surveys were actually being collected for a few months there. But when they picked back up with the program, uh, the pandemic was in full swing. And you can see a small decline in, in all of these modes, uh, except telecommuting, uh, which went from 4.3, it's on the, on the right hand side in the light gray there, 4.3% share of travel to 25.8% share of travel. Uh, here we are only looking at telecommuting, not the other modes um, for both years, and we have broken it down by employer industry. Uh, now, what may stand out at first glance uh, is how could mining, quarrying, and oil and gas extraction possibly have the largest increase in teleworking? That seems kind of odd, and well, that's an anomaly because the increase in uh, Highly, is, it's highly represented by uh, industry headquarters being located within Maricopa County where they take the surveys. But aside from that, we can clearly see that business, finance, and professional industries had the largest increases while uh, like food services, retail, transportation, those saw the least um, uh, increase in telecommuting. And again, here we have broken it down by the employee occupation of it, as opposed to the employer industry. Uh, and this is based on question number one of the survey. And although all occupations saw an increase in telecommuting, we can clearly see which occupations had you know, a more significant increase and which ones didn't. Um, and we see the same trends that we saw with the employer industry. Business, finance, professional jobs had significant increases while service oriented jobs such as like those that require one to physically be at a job site have very small increases. Uh, here is just another way of visualizing, visualizing what was on the previous slide. Uh, rather than viewing the total percent for each year at the same time, this graph just uh, illustrates the difference in percent telecommuting by occupation from one year to the next. And here again, broken down by occupation, we have all of the mode shares for each year side by side where the turquoise uh, indicating the increase in telecommuting really jumps out at you. Um, something else that may also stand out a bit is that some of these occupations that only had a small, a very small increase in telecommuting also had a decrease in transit and an increase uh, in driving along. Um, you can see building and maintenance at the top there, construction, food and service, public safety and security. Um, they all declined uh, in transit and increased in, in driving alone. This may largely be due to the disruption in transit service and could also be from uh, loss of carpool partners. Uh, but let's see. Okay. So that was very quick, just a little quick overview on trends in telecommuting. That's all I have to share. Um, I did wanna let you know that we do have an online dashboard where you can explore some of these commute patterns uh, based on the TRP surveys. And we also have several PDF live-in, work-in maps by jurisdiction um, that are available to, for you to download. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for your time. I am going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Debbie. Does anyone have any questions or comments on this item? Um, I actually do, Rudy Lopez, City Maricopa, Debbie. Hey, um, I'm just kind of curious, did that also account for government agencies as well? When, when the office or public, public administration, did that account for government, local cities or state or? I'm sorry, agencies? could you repeat the last half? Did it, I heard that you were asking if it was 
for if it included yeah. the agencies, but the TRP surveys are taken by all all uh, agencies, including uh, private and, and government business, uh, as long as there's 50 plus employees at the site. Okay, no, that was my question. Thank you. Uh, what, sorry, this is Peter Burnett with Mag. One, one thing to clarify is that the surveys are within Maricopa County. So the, the, those surveys don't go out to the city of Maricopa, Rudy. Well, that, just for the, yeah, the, it's for employees that may live in Maricopa, but the actual employment, the, the actual employers are only within Maricopa County. Sorry, Peter, I didn't mean to jump in and cut that through. I haven't seen an update on air quality lately, but um, is our air quality correlating with this increase in commuting? Telecommuting? Um, I believe that initially, I haven't haven't seen any updates with it um, as well, but initially, no, I don't think, I think we were seeing, we weren't seeing a downward trend, but I could, I, I don't really know enough to speak to that. I'm sorry, I um, can look into it for you though. Or if anybody else here, Peter, Jesse, if you guys know, um, if there's been a recent look at the correlation between- that would, that would have to be discovered with our air quality department and we can find out what they've been analyzing and studying with that. Scott, if you wanna follow up on that, that would be great. Yeah, I can, I can do that. I know that they're looking at it. Um, I think that there was an uh, increase in air quality initially. I don't know where we are now, but I remember hearing that back at the beginning of, of uh, the pandemic, but uh, yeah, we can find out. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? Crystal, I'd just like to make a comment. Yeah. Hey, um, um, if we can track this too over time, it'd be fun to see kind of what where we actually land on the trends of telecommuting over the next year too. It'd be good to see. Um, <clears throat> I, I, everybody says a new normal or whatever, but I, I do think things will change. I think we are changing it. So, It'd be fun to track that for another year or two. I, I agree. I'm actually really, uh, really interested in seeing um, how how much of a decline there is in the next couple of years, and and if it it just always does stay above what it what it used to be. But I, I'm curious to see how many people decide to just go back to the office. In addition to that, I think we're all curious, and that's a great question. We're definitely going to be keeping an eye on that with this source so that we have with the TRP data. That said, if anybody knows of any other sources of uh, work from home data, we'd love to hear about that. Um, I think we'd like to do a deeper dive on this on a more regular basis. Uh, there's a lot of questions up in the air on what's happening with the work from home and what's going to happen with office space and things like that. So just a lot of questions that we need answers to and any extra source material we can get our hands on, we'd love to hear about it. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, next on the agenda, we have the MEG housing dashboard demonstration and Maggie's gonna do that. Thanks, Maggie. Can you see my screen? Awesome, thank you. Good morning, my name is Maggie Wong. I'm a research analyst with MAG's Regional Analytics Division. And yeah, excited to be here this morning to introduce our new interactive dashboard that you can see here. It's our housing data explorer. So for the past few years, we've made um, quite a few presentations discussing economic trends during the pandemic. And a big part of that, a big question was the topic of housing affordability in the region. Um, we saw a lot of interest from member agencies. So in response to those requests, we decided to uh, make the data accessible through this new dashboard. So this tool includes a variety of interactive charts to help visualize trends in the data, including sales, apartment rent, evictions, cost burden, households, and foreclosures. So I'll just do a quick walkthrough and demo of the interactive dashboard. So first off, you can see in the blue right here, there's a little drop down list where you can select a community. So it includes Maricopa County and then cities and towns within the MAG region. Um, we do want to note that data is shown where available. So some geographies um, specific data are excluded for certain topics due to insufficient or missing data. Like if we have a very small sample size and it just doesn't seem very consistent, we would um, hide that for now. But if you have any questions on that, you can always contact us. Um, but I'll go ahead and start with the sales tab. So right up top, we've got this line chart showing median sales price trends. So the thicker blue line right here, this is showing the overall median sales price. This data is going back to January of 2015. We do have some more historical data beyond that, but just thought we'd show this time period for now. The other color lines are showing specific um, type of sales. So single family, condo, and townhouse. 
Um, so yeah, you can hover over the lines to see um, each month's specific median sales price. And you'll see right under here, this very small bar chart here. This is showing the number of overall sales transactions. Um, and it corresponds with the line chart right above it. So you can kind of see that trend by month and see how that compares with the trend in the median sales price. Right under, right under this, we've got this stacked bar chart and it's showing price trends for the selected geography. So this is showing the percent of sales based on pricing. And right away, you can see a pretty significant um, change uh, decrease in the number of sales transactions that are under $200,000. Not too surprising, but still interesting to see nonetheless. Um, so this is something to explore. The last thing on this tab is we included a median sales price comparison table. So this shows um, all of the geographies available along with the most recent median sales price, which is December of 2021, along with percent change um, since December of 2020. And this chart is sortable. So if you just click on any of the column headers, you can sort it. And um, this is really just meant to help you compare across geographies a little easier. So the next tab shows apartment rent. Um, we start with this pretty simple chart here showing the median rent for the most recent quarter, Q4 2021, um, by unit type. So the first bar along with the dashed line is just showing the overall median rent for the selected geography. Um, and then we break it down by each unit type. And you can see that if you hover over a bar, it'll show you not only median rent, but the number of apartment units um, included in the analysis, um, along with percent change since Q4 of 2020. This next chart is pretty similar to what we just saw on the sales tab. It's showing um, rent trends. So the percent of apartment units um, by monthly rent category. Um, again, a pretty big decrease in the number of apartment units under $1,000. Again, not surprising, but still pretty interesting to track and see. And then similarly to before, we also have a comparison table with the most recent median rent. So for Q4 2021, along with percent change since a year prior. And again, these tables are sortable and meant for um, easy comparison. So the next tab, this is something we've presented on quite a bit actually, uh, monthly eviction filings. So this data comes um, directly from the Maricopa County Justice Courts. So it's limited to cities and towns within Maricopa County. Um, and also for this analysis, um, we receive an entire uh, data export from the Justice Courts, but we only include um, locations, we only include records that have a location. Um, there are some unknowns that we've excluded from our analysis for this, but this data um, we have since January of 2019, just to show some of the pre-pandemic, pre-COVID numbers here in the gray. And then you can see for the teal right away that drop in March of 2020, um, all the way down to May of 2020, when the eviction moratoriums were fully in place and how that affected eviction filings and how it's been rising since then. The table below it is showing 2021 evictions by month by geography. Um, and once again, sortable. So you can take a look um, each month at um, you know, which cities and towns had um, what number of eviction filings. This next tab here is pretty simple. We're using um, ACS five-year estimate data to look at um, the cost burden of households. So this is showing households that are paying greater than 30% or greater than 50% of their income on housing expenses. Um, and one thing to note is that if you select um, a city or town, it'll show it in comparison to Maricopa County. So for example, here for Chandler, you can see that um, the number of households paying greater than 30% or the number of households paying greater than 50% are both lower than for the county. And the final tab here is showing distressed properties and foreclosures. So this is the one tab that cannot be filtered by geography. We're only showing the overall trends for Maricopa County, but the data goes back to March of 2009. And um, not too surprising, we're just seeing a decline, pretty sustained, um, and it's um, by category. So blue is distressed properties, orange is pending foreclosure, and then green is bank or government owned properties. And one thing I didn't note before is that at the bottom of each tab, we have a couple notes on our data and analysis. So there are some limitations to what we're showing, but we listed them there. So always feel free to ask questions um, if you have any on that. But I think that about wraps up the demo. Um, I know the link is included in the agenda packet, but another way to access it is by going to you know, our maps and data page. And this is right under our land use and real estate category. So right here up top, this is another way to get to the housing dashboard. 
I do also want to note that this is kind of a beta version initial release. So we have more things planned. Um, we want to update it with additional data and analysis and add some more features to this in the future. We want to add something where you can download the data or just make it easy for you to export um, the charts to use in presentations and such. But until those are added, you can always feel free to contact us if you um, would like some help with that. So we're always open to feedback and hope that this can be a useful tool. So that's all I have. And let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for that wonderful demonstration, Maggie. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Looks like Scott put a note. <laughs> I just noticed something during Maggie's dem demonstration that needs to get fixed. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I didn't need to. I'll get to that right after this, yeah. <laughs> I didn't, didn't need to broadcast it. Sorry. Okay. Well, that was for information and discussion. So thank you for that, Maggie. Uh, next, um, we have a, Scott is going to provide some information about upcoming general plan updates post COVID-19. Scott? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm not gonna present uh, any information. I'm gonna ask a question. Um, we have been seeing a lot of um, general plan, a lot of general plans were, were adopted during the, the recession 10 years ago. So the 10 year clock expired around now. And so we're seeing a lot of updates. Um, and so one thing we're wondering is if um, you, those of you who are working on an update or are about to work on an update, if you have seen anything that, or you're considering anything in this update that you didn't need to think about 10 years ago, um, something specific to the pandemic that maybe you're thinking more about work from home um, or a uh, difference in commuting patterns or more live work units, that kind of thing, or maybe um, uh, technology Tech changes in technology that, that you didn't think about 10 years ago, like autonomous vehicles, um, uh, electric, so, uh, you know, electric charging at uh, home or in, in parking lots, things like that. And so I just wanted to open it up. Um, I know we've got a lot of people from planning departments in, on the committee, and I just wanted to, to hear from those who are working on a general plan update or are planning to getting, getting started to if, if uh, things are just kind of business as usual, or um, if you are considering new things that, that you've never had to consider in, the, in past updates. Hey Scott, this is Taylor from the city of Scottsdale. Mm -hmm. Thank you Taylor. And we were lucky enough to just get our general plan ratified uh, November of this past year. Um, so we were doing our update in the midst of the pandemic. So we were working with a uh, citizen review committee through the year of 2020. So all of those meetings were remote. Um, and because it was during the pandemic, it was brought up quite a bit. Uh, obviously we weren't on the tail end of it to, to know, like you're talking about the live work kind of thing, or um, maybe some of the electrical charging stuff, which, which we do have some of that built into our environmental uh, planning element. Um, but in terms of our safety element, we did, sprinkle in things here and there about specifically to reacting to a pandemic in terms of goals and policies, but um, trying to think other than that, if, if anything else specifically came up again, we were in, in the middle of it, not so much, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully towards the end, as it seems like we are now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's great. That's something we had when we were talking about this internally, we hadn't even thought about the safety element um, and pandemics themselves. Anyone else? Okay. Um, well, this uh, is something that we're really interested in. Um, as you as you know, those of you who have gone through the long range projections. Um, cycle in the past, you know, that we heavily rely on on general plans for uh, for land use information looking out to the future. And so we're trying to figure out if we need to make drastic changes to our model because your general plans have new things that we've never had to consider before, or if it's just kind of the same thing it was 10 years ago. So um, 
please, you know, get, feel free to get in touch with me offline. Um, I know we'll be talking about this during the, uh, the projections review, but uh, we'd love to hear from you. And we just want to know um, if there are things that uh, haven't been in general plans before that are, that are coming up now. So unless anybody has any other, anything else to contribute, that might be all I have for this one. Thanks, Scott. And next you'll provide us with some legislative updates. Yes, um, this was, I originally put this on the agenda um, because, where did my notes go? Uh, you may have heard about um, House Bill 2674, which would be the end of residential zoning as we know it. Um, this was an attempt to address housing affordability by increasing supply. Um, my reading of it, there were lots of problems and lots of unintended consequences and no real solutions for housing affordability, um, but it would have allowed um, by right, like eight eight units per acre on anything that allows residential units. Um, that bill is has been essentially withdrawn. Um, the language in the bill was struck through, and is now the bill is now creating a study committee to look at this issue and try to come up with actual solutions instead of just what they proposed originally. Um, and so. I'm involved in uh, the Legislative Affairs Committee through the Arizona Planning Association. We're hoping to get somebody on that, that study committee. Um, and there'll be people from all across the, the state and all across in different industries. Um, but uh, hopefully they'll be able to, to come up with some, some workable solutions and maybe we'll see something in uh, the legislature next year. So I was, if you had heard about that bill, if you read about it, um, heard about it through, through your inner gov, I just wanna make sure you knew that uh, that language is no longer being considered. It's a relief, thank you. Yes, uh, it was. Um, the only other thing of, of interest to uh, most people in this committee that, that I know of, there are three bills addressing um, the short-term rentals um, and they all kind of tackle different aspects of the prohibition against regulating short-term rentals that, that passed a couple of years ago and uh, helped fuel the, the explosion in short-term rentals as Jesse demonstrated earlier. Um, so there are three bills that um, address different aspects of it. My understanding is that they're, they're largely supported by cities and towns. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to come up with some solutions for that. Those bill numbers, um, in case you're interested, 2234, 2625, and 2663. Um, I've spent a little bit of time looking at them with the Legislative Affairs Committee, and I, I don't, none of them are perfect. None of them do everything that, that uh, the cities and towns want or need them to do, but um, it is a start and does uh, add some tools to the toolbox for helping um, to address that. Um, so if anybody has any questions on those, I can, I can talk um, about that, or if you have any other bills you're interested in, um, we can uh, we can kind of track those as well and and find out um, what the status of those. Maybe provide those in a future meeting uh, update or uh, through email. But I'm happy to take any questions. Scott, this is Dave with City Thinks. What was the uh, house bill number of the first bill you discussed for the low income housing? Um, it wasn't low income housing. It was housing affordability. It was trying to basically get more housing. Um, into the supply, uh, 2674 yeah, thank is you. what was originally proposed as ending residential zoning essentially, um, and now as a study committee to look at the housing affordability. Got it, thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, I think that's all I have then. Thank you, Scott. Well, that was uh, the last, um, business item on the agenda. The next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, March 22nd at 10 a.m. And with that, we are adjourned. We do, before we adjourn, we did have one more thing. We'd like, we have a new staff member that Peter Burnett wants to introduce to everybody, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Thanks, thanks Scott, for jumping in and doing that. 
Uh, it is my privilege to introduce to all of you Michael Wu. Uh, he just started recently at the end of January. Uh, he's got his camera on there. So if you want to say hello, Michael. Looks like you can't hear you. But it doesn't look like you're muted. Uh, I don't think oh, there we go. Now we can hear okay. you. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Michael. <laughs> Uh, Michael comes to us. He, he has a background in economics. He has a bachelor's and master's degree in economics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, he most recently was working for a company called SMS Research and Marketing Services. Uh, he did a lot of data analysis and extraction and then cleaning and uh, worked with all sorts of different data sets. Um, he comes, with, with, comes to us with some great experience. He's, he's a research analyst too with us now. His primary responsibility with MAG will be uh, the employer database that we work on annually. Uh, many of you probably have been copied already on some email requests for some public data. So you had a brief introduction to him at that point. But uh, we're just real excited to have Michael join us and get started with us. So, Michael, do you have anything? Did I miss anything? Do you want to add anything? No, that, that, that'd be good. Thank you. Okay. Just excited to have him. Welcome to Michael. Yes, welcome to Michael. With that, seeing no further business, we are adjourning. Have a great Thank day. You. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.